Welcome back to Vintage Camera Digest. A few weeks ago on this channel, I featured the Bronica S2A. When those early 6x6 Bronicas first came out, there wasn't anything else like them, and that included the lenses. If you've been looking to pick up a new lens or two for your Bronica S series or EC series cameras, you may have noticed some marked Nikkor, some marked Zenzanon, and some marked Komura. Today, we're going to try to clear up any confusion surrounding these lenses, so stick around. If you missed the episode of the Bronica S2A, I recommend you check it out. I'll leave a link at the end of this video. But I'm going to review some of the highlights for you here. The original 6x6 format Bronica cameras weren't anything like what the company would produce later, beginning with the ETR. Their later cameras were all based on leaf shutter systems, meaning that the shutters were incorporated into each lens. The early Bronicas, from the original Deluxe model, the S and C series, to the EC series, all featured focal plane shutters, along with another unique feature of having the focusing helicoid as part of the camera body, not the lens. Take this Koa lens. Just like almost every other lens in the world, it has its own focusing helicoid. This lens for the Bronica, though, just has the lens elements, and an aperture control, and that's it. There's no way to focus it separate from the camera. And since the mirror slid down under the lens during exposure instead of flipping up, it meant that these lenses could mount deep in the camera body close to the film plane. Theoretically, it meant that the lenses could be smaller than their competitors. If you compare the standard 75 millimeter here to the standard 85 millimeter of the Koa, for instance, it's easy to see the size difference. And of course, a smaller lens meant less weight too. So if we weigh the Koa, it tops the scale at 504 grams. The Bronica lens, however, is at 208 grams, so it's not even half the weight. Uh, now, the Bronica camera body is probably made up for that weight difference, but that's another story altogether. But there were other ways to mount lenses on the Bronica too. The focusing helicoid on the original Z, D, and S was built into the camera body. But starting with the S2 and the C, that helicoid was separate and removable. So here we have the actual helicoid on the camera body, but it's also removable. This meant that long telephotos could be used that came with their own focusing helicoid. You would just need to remove the one from the body and that would reveal a larger bayonet mount. And if that wasn't enough, the inside edge of the removable helicoid has a 57 millimeter screw thread that the extension tube set for these cameras used. Also, it meant that if you were clever enough, you could mount whatever lens you wanted as long as it fit the 57 millimeter thread because the focusing was built into this. But if you've been thinking about picking up one of these old Bronicas and are a bit confused about the lenses, well, hopefully this will help straighten it out. The first thing you might notice about these cameras is that a lot of the lenses are marked Nikkor. And I know that's one of the first things I noticed about them years ago. And I was like, okay, what's the relationship between Bronica and Nikon? Is Bronica brand really from Nikon? I think it might be a common misconception that Nikon was the parent company of Bronica, but that's not the case at all. The explanation is quite simple. Zenzaburo Yoshino, the man behind the development of the Bronica, sunk so much of his money into the production of the camera that there was not much left for lens production when they hit the market in the late 1950s. So they entered into a partnership with Nikon to supply lenses for the new system. And for the first few years, Nikon was the only supplier. Uh, about 1965, however, the time the Bronica S2 and C models were released, another lens maker, Komura, was offering a more budget-friendly line of lenses for the Bronicas. Now, this was all well and good for a few years, but by the late 1960s, Nikon was becoming a little disenchanted with the partnership. And by the time the Bronica EC cameras hit the market in 1972, Nikon was out. This led to a short supply of 75 millimeter normal lenses that were needed to be shipped with the new EC cameras. Now, I think Bronick had probably been expecting that partnership to dissolve sooner or later and had been developing their own lenses up to this under the Zenzanon name. Still, they weren't quite ready and they needed lenses to ship with the new cameras. So filling that gap was a Zenzanon branded Carl Zeiss Jena 80 millimeter 2.8. 
That was only a temporary solution though and was the only Zeiss lens ever produced for the Bronica. And as you would expect, those lenses are highly sought after. But they finally got up to speed with their own Zinzanon lenses and as the Nikkor supply wound down, these new Zinzanon lenses proliferated and were produced up through the end of the Bronica EC camera line in 1980. So let's recap. In the first two decades of Bronica camera production, you have Nikkor, Comira, Zinzanon lenses, and one Carl Zeiss Zinzanon lens to choose from. And you can find most of these pretty easily on eBay these days. So, which ones are the ones to have if you own one of these Bronicas? Well, I don't have all these lenses, but I do have several here for us to look at. Let's start with the 75mm 2.8. Actually, this is labeled as a 7.5cm lens, so you know it's early 60s for sure. By the way, the letter that follows the word Nikkor on these old lenses tells you how many elements make up the lens. The P on this one, for example, refers to Pente and indicates that this lens is made up of five elements. Now, this old lens isn't much to look at cosmetically. It is brassing around the chrome and there's some corrosion on the finish. But optically, I think this 60-year-old lens is great. It's got good sharpness and contrast, and it's probably one of the better lenses to own for this system. Luckily, there are plenty of them out there, and you will usually find them included with the camera body. Also, in that very first batch of Nikkor's made for Bronica, you had a 50mm 3.5, a 135mm 3.5, which I have here, a 200mm f4, a 400 millimeter 4.5 and a 600 millimeter 5.6. And as I mentioned earlier, Camira made lenses for the Bronica at a lower price point. These would include a 45 millimeter 4.5, a 50 millimeter 3.5, a 100 millimeter 2.8, a 150 millimeter 3.5, a 200 3.5, a 300 f5, a 406.3, and even a 500 F7. Soon, however, Bronica would add a few new Nikkors to the lineup with a 40 millimeter F4, a 50 millimeter 2.8 to replace the older 53.5, another 75 millimeter that features a slightly different lens formula, and a 105 3.5 with a built-in leaf shutter, which was nice because the flash sync speed of the focal plane on these cameras is only 1 40th of a second. Then, as the Nikkors were being phased out, Bronica's own lenses, the Zinzanons, would be added to the lineup. These would include a 40 millimeter f4, a 52.8, a 75 2.8, an 80 millimeter 2.4, the 80 millimeter 2.8 Zeiss that we talked about, a 102.8, a 153.5, a 203.5, a 200 f4, and a 304.5. Now to complicate things just a little further, some of these Zinzanons and the Nikors existed in two different forms. They had the standard version and a multi-coated version. And these are pretty easy to distinguish from the others though because Nikon added the letter C to their lens names to reflect this. For example, the Nikkor O 50mm 2.8 would become the Nikkor OC 50mm 2.8. And the Nikkor P 75 2.8 would become a Nikkor PC. On the Zinzanon lenses, Bronica simply included MC in the name, usually in red lettering. Man, that is a lot to process and keep straight. But of all these lenses, these are the ones that I have. The Nikkor 50mm 2.8 multi-coated version, the Nikkor 75s, both the standard and the coated versions, the Nikkor 135, and the standard version of the 200 f4. I also have a multi-coated version of the Zinzanon 75 as well as both versions, the non-multi-coated and the multi-coated version of the 153.5. So, what's the bottom line? What's my take on these? Well, as I alluded to before, the Nikkor 70mm is probably my favorite. It's sharp, it's contrasty, it can focus down to about 18 inches or a half a meter. And as far as sharpness goes, I don't think any of the others quite can get there. They're no slouches, but, you know, that 75 is really nice. The 50 is also a great sharp wide angle that focuses all the way down to about 9 inches or a quarter of a meter. The Nikkor 135 can focus down to about 56 inches or 1.4 meters. And the Zinzanon 150, it's a little bit longer focal length and will focus down to about 69 inches or 1.8 meters. The Nikkor 200's minimum focusing distance 
isn't that impressive. It'll only focus down to about 10 feet or 3 meters. And that might be an issue if you're thinking of using that lens as a portrait lens. It just doesn't get close enough for a tight head and shoulder shot. But there's a solution, as always. A special matched close-up filter was made just for this lens that brings the focusing distance down to about half of that. So five feet or one and a half meters. And definitely into the range of a nice tight portrait. Of course, you can always use the Bronica extension tube set to get a little closer. I've compared using these tubes against the close-up filter, and contrary to what you might think, I prefer the filter. It just seems a tad sharper. Somehow. And as for standard or multi-coated versions, well, theoretically, the multi-coated versions should exhibit much less lens flare. However, you won't find multi-coated versions of the Nikkor 135 or the early 53.5 which is said to be a flare monster. But that 50 was eventually replaced by the completely different 2.8 version, and you can find both standard and coded versions of that one. As for the Nikkor 135, well, this lens was never released in a coded version or updated beyond the first edition of it. And if you read the web, you will see that the consensus is that it's the worst lens of the entire bunch. It is a bit softer than the Zinzanon 150s, I think, but I don't think it's terrible. Uh, still, I'll almost always opt for the Zinzanon 150 given the choice. Now, this would be a perfect time in the video to show some examples of all these lenses at work. And I can do some of them for sure, but last week was a holiday week here in the US and we did a lot of traveling and I just did not have time to get that done. We'll revisit these in the near future because I'd like to test them out in a portrait setting. But that wraps it up for the confusing history of Bronica Nikkor Zinzanon lenses. And I'd love to hear any experiences you've had with these. In particular, I'd love to hear about the Nikkor 40mm and the original 3.5, as well as any of the longer telephotos such as the 300, 400, or 600mm. Also, if you've used any of the Comira lenses, what was your take? I'd really like to see if they're that much inferior to the Nikors or Zinzanons. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Please leave a like if so. Also, consider subscribing to the channel as there's a new episode every week. And if you really enjoyed it, think about hitting that super thanks button below and buying me a roll of film. Just letting you know that's a new option too. I will see y'all next week.